Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Off the Shelf. It's the program by the Sisters in Crime Atlanta chapter, where Dawn Getfer, our own member of the chapter, interviews an author about their life and their book and an attempt to get the books off the shelf and into the hands of readers. We're very excited this morning to have with us Robert Waltney, who is the author of the very, very popular The Cicada Tree. It's his debut novel. And he has also been published in the Signal Mountain Review, the Blue Mountain Review, and the Dead Mule School <laughs> of Southern Literature. Robert comes to us from Cairo, Georgia, and that sounds spelled like the city, not the syrup. And from there, he went south to Florida State University, and then he bounced back up here to Atlanta, where he is now living with his partner. And during the day, he is vice president for Easter Seals. And he says all the time in between, he is writing. And we're very excited to have Robert here with us. And Dawn, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's a beautiful day in Atlanta. And um, so I appreciate you being here with us and getting it started. Um, really excited to have Robert here with us. Um, Robert, I always like to start off our conversations with our authors by asking them to give us their backstory. So I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about yourself aside from who you are as a writer? Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Southwest Georgia, a small town called Cairo. I really lived my entire life in the South. Uh, with, with, I actually was born in Harrelin, Holland in the Netherlands. My dad was in the service. Um, they were stationed in Germany. And so I was only over there a couple of years before we moved back to my parents' hometown of Cairo. So that's where I grew up. So other than those just first couple of years, um, overseas. I've lived my entire life in, in the South, and of course, that certainly impacts my worldview, my frame of reference, and, um, and of course, the writing. But um, I think that, and I grew up with, with, with three, I'm the oldest of four boys. I'm the, uh, I'm the typical first child type A personality, extremely anal retentive. There's quite a gap between myself and my youngest brother. So in a way, I was sort of a third parent. So I'm the, I'm the typical older bossy brother who was left to babysit quite a bit. Um, I grew, uh, after leaving Cairo, I went to, to Tallahassee. I uh, attended Florida State University. Upon completing my college there, I worked in state government and human resources. Um, and then in around 2000, I moved to Atlanta. And uh, when coming to Atlanta, you know, I knew that I'd always wanted to write. Uh, and you know, I was in my 30s at that point. And I, and I knew that if I didn't start, it might not ever happen. I had this sort of vision of myself years into the future at the very end of things, just feeling very regretful that I hadn't tried. And so I would say maybe around 2003, I got really serious. I signed up for classes at the Margaret Mitchell house. At the end of the work day, I would take the train down. Uh, one of my first classes with is with Atlanta writer, David Fulmer. Uh, you know, I didn't know, you know, if I had any potential or if there was any possibility that I might be able to be a writer. I joined the Atlanta Writers Club and just sort of surrounded myself in community and um, all these years later, I was able to get my first book out into the world. And and what a debut. It has been definitely very, very well received. Um, let's go before we go there, because I def we definitely want to go there. But um, tell us, why did you go to Florida State University? What did you study? I, I studied. Well, initially, I thought that I wanted to be a communications major. Um. Yeah, I thought it would be really cool to be a newscaster, <laughs> but um, but then you know I I met a few, I visited a couple of local stations, and the life is really really tough. And um, I didn't really right out of college want to start off living in poverty because that's what I told would that's what I was told would be happening. I would probably be running cables. It would not be very glamorous. So from there, I switched to political science. I thought, well, maybe I'll be 
an attorney. <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to be. <laughs> um, and I think that it's really awful that young people have to decide, you know, by the age of 18, how they want to spend the rest of their life. So initially it was communications, I, but it was when I was taking those communications classes that I was taking creative writing courses. So I felt like somewhere deep inside me, there was a storyteller. And I always liked the prospect of being a writer. It's nothing that I really ever declared until many, many years later. Um, but when it was all said and done, what did I do with that political science degree and international affairs degree? I, I worked um, in human resources and state government, and worked my way up to director of human resources. Um, so that, so I'm really, I don't have an MFA. I don't have a literature degree. It's, I'm just sort of one of those self-taught folks. <laughs> I guess they, these last 20 years of just trying, I guess, has been my, my degree in writing. Um, so, uh, well, you kind of already answered this question. I was kind of curious. Like, first off, I had to look up Cairo, Georgia, because mm -hmm. I, I am unfamiliar with it. And what I found out was it's it's very small, and I believe it's it's very close to Florida. Yes. Okay. So in my mind, I was like, well, maybe he went to Florida State because that was like the closest thing, sort of like I'm yes. in Henry County, so I'm going to go to Georgia State. Like I I and I didn't answer your question fully. I'm sorry. No. I sort of jumped ahead, but you know, I everyone wanted to go to to um to the University of Georgia. And, you know, I grew up in such a small town, extremely sheltered, that I was actually a little nervous about leaving and going too far from home initially. Uh, Florida State was closer. It seemed like I could sort of have the best of both worlds. I could go to a large university, but not be too terribly far from home. So that was sort of the allure for me to staying close to home when most young folks just wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. <laughs> that is true that is true is so that in Gainesville Florida is that why it was closer um so so Tallahassee is Tallahassee? much closer to Cairo Georgia than Gainesville I think it's maybe 30 40 minutes just across the the state oh. line there so we're very close to Florida okay so it's kind of leave lends to my next question. And by the way, everybody, please feel free to chime in, ask questions, or if you're uncomfortable speaking up, you can uh, put a question in the chat and we will ask it for you. So please do, please participate. We That's what we love about doing this format. So Cairo is like, the last census said that there's 11,000 people and that it's a 10, it's only 10 square miles. So it's really small. And I just got to ask, what does one do in Cairo, Georgia? Cairo, Georgia. What are they My doing? mom and dad still reside in Cairo, Georgia. My dad was, uh, in, well, I guess like he still is an electrical engineer and um, on the city council there. He's retired. So he just is doing his city council work now. And my mom was uh, had a very difficult job of staying home, managing a home with with four boys. Um, when I was in high school, she later went on to to uh, to do some small nonprofit work there in in Cairo, where she would work with first time mothers, go into the hospitals, teach them how to care for their children, and then she would do follow up visits. Uh, it is it, it's a small town. I think a lot there are probably a lot of commute patterns. Uh, of individuals going outside of Cairo to Thomasville and to Tallahassee to work. When I was coming along, there, one of the largest employers was this company called Roddenberry's, and they made pickles and peanut butter and boiled peanuts. Uh, Roddenberry's is no longer in existence. They sold the company some years ago when another company, I actually worked there at the pickle factory when I was 16 years old. So there's not a whole lot to do in Cairo. <laughs> And uh, you do feel um, uh, there's quite a shift, you know, when I drive through the city limits from Atlanta into Cairo, it's um, what you would expect in a small rural southern town. And, and you had mentioned that it was your parents' hometown and your yes. dad was in the military and traveled and yet he came home to Cairo and you guys settled, the family settled yes. in the family's hometown. So how many generations of um, Gwaltneys are there in Cairo? 
uh, I, I'm guessing that the, I believe that the Gwaltneys first made their way into the Grady County sort of Florida area in the in the 1800s. Uh, there is um, there is this old plantation called Mistletoe in between between Cairo and and Tallahassee, uh, and I actually sort of stole that plantation name. But the, the there's a family connection there in that. My, my dad's parents, the Gwaltneys, were farmers, so they owned a very small farm that was eventually purchased by the owners of Mistletoe and um, combined into the plantation. And so my my great-great-grandparents took that money and bought a farm in Grady County, where they farmed for, um, for, for many years thereafter. So your family is, is farmers. We're farmers in the area, and yes. now your dad is an electrical engineer. Right. And you refer to your brothers in your bio as feral. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Tell us about your feral brothers and what they're doing. All doing well. You know, we, we we get along beautifully. And they love the fact that I refer to them as my feral brothers. They get a kick out of that. Some individuals think they might be offended, but they actually take pride in it. <laughs> my my uh the brother after me, my brother Chris is an executive for ABC Liquors, and uh, he looks like a castmate from Duck Dynasty, <laughs> but he is one of the smartest, uh, most brilliant minds I've ever met. He um, he travels, he's traveled all through Europe. He can tell you anything and everything you'd want to know about any wine ever made, how to make it, um, tr travels to Cuba. Um, they also have a line of high-end cigars, so he knows how cigars are made. So he's far more well-traveled than I am. I, um, my brother. Ben, my brother after me, works for UPS. He has two sets of twins, boys, uh, all um, first grade and younger, and they weren't trying. My dad was a twin, oh, and wow. um, and my baby brother is an out. My brother Chance, he is he lives close to my mom and dad in Florida, and he works um, in the field of forestry. He's an he's an outdoorsy sort of fella. My husband's a forester. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we're in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's get you from Cairo to Atlanta and um, tell, I, you have a very, very interesting day job and I think it's important. And so I really am hoping you can talk a little bit about that and tell us what you do and about the organization. So I moved from uh, Tallahassee. I was the director of human resources for Florida State Hospital uh, when I left, which is a very fascinating place. It's um, the state mental hospital, and uh, the administration building is an old plantation house that Andrew Jackson once slept in. It's in Chattahoochee, Florida. There actually are Civil War tunnels that go down to the river. So it's just really odd. That there's a, a series of 1970s buildings and then, you know, this sort of antebellum home. So it is, it is just a really peculiar place. So you have um, the criminally, um, was, I think Ted Bundy was taken there. Um, so you've got those individuals that are high security and then those in, those residents that sort of roam the campus. So that was fascinating um, place to work. So I left there to go work for Easter Seals, North Georgia as director of human resources. And uh, I was in that position up until about 10 years ago where I've worked my way into position of vice president of early education and care. And Easter Seals, uh, we are part of a national affiliate we have been in, we're over 100 years old um, nationally, and in the state of Georgia, we've been providing services uh, for uh, going on 50 years now. No, I'm sorry, 65 years now. So we've been in Georgia for quite a while. So the one commonality that Easter Seals has from one affiliate to the next is disabilities. We work with children six weeks up to five years of age. We provide one of our largest service lines, the service line that I'm responsible for is early education and care. So we provide high quality early education and care programming to those children up to five years of age. All of our children are living at or below poverty and about 30% of our children have a diagnosed disability. 
Wow. But we are, so we take a two generational approach. Not only are we uh, ensuring that children are ready for kindergarten, wow. but their families are able to support their children's continued learning as their child's first and most important teacher and advocate. So we have family support advocates, caseworkers at all of our locations who work with our families to, to, to goal set, to be able to ensure that they have the resources that they need to be able to, uh, to progress, depending upon what their specific family's needs are. And, and I know that you have referenced Easter Seals of North Georgia. So what is that? What is that territory? Where does it start? So we, the most southern part? And sure. So we have um, we serve 44 counties. Our early education and care program is um, in uh, Metro Atlanta. We just ventured into DeKalb, where we've where we have, we're managing four centers and two community partnerships all the way up to the Clark County area, um, Athens. So we have two locations in Barrow. Um, we, we call one our Barrow location, one our Wander location. So uh, Metro Atlanta, Northeast Georgia, and into DeKalb. Mm -hmm. A big territory, for sure. Large one. All right, so that's your day job. And I imagine it's very time consuming. And I I'm also would think that there's some emotional elements there that maybe zap your energy. And yet you have been pulled by the call to write. You mentioned that that's been with you most of your life. So tell us about finding the time and, and, and getting started with your writing. That's the, that's the hard part, really, you know, the, uh, the, the, all the hours in between. So I, I'm trying to get myself back on track of getting up about 4.30 in the morning to write a couple of hours before I have to go to Easter Seals. Uh, I'm, I'm a morning writer. It's really hard for me at the end of the day to come in and make anything happen on the page. So early morning writing and, of course, weekends are prime writing time for me as well. So, you know, I can get in a couple of hours a day. And then I live in my sweatpants on the weekends, uh, on occasion, um, going to the grocery store, maybe. <laughs> I did. It's funny, when I was writing the first book, I didn't have quite the sense of urgency that I feel that I have now uh, working on a second book. Uh, so there, I, um, and things seem to be going a bit more swiftly than they did the first time around. But I do have this the sense, of, the sense of urgency that now that I've got one book out of the world, I really do need to get get something else out there, not too far behind it. Do you have a deadline? Yeah, that's my question. I don't. Well, I have a personal deadline of wanting to have it finished, um, have a good solid draft by this time next year, maybe even having done a pass of revisions. I'm about 30,000 words into probably what will be a 90,000 word book. So I don't have. I, I'm not under contract for this book, so I will. So I'll have to go through the whole process of going through query again. Uh, so we'll see. It is. It's a little nerve wracking, uh, you know, when you're working on a book and you're not sure that someone might want it. <laughs> so it's just sort of keeping your fingers crossed and writing what you love. So you you have been published in in periodicals and. I'm imagining that is not your novel. So you were writing prior to actually writing the novel that, what, what is the so, beginnings of it? So, so this is interesting. I, so when you're writing a novel, I mean, it really does eat all of your time. And I admire those individuals who can do several things at once. Or um, I, for me, I become obsessed over the story that I'm working on, the characters. I can't think of anything else beyond that. So it was three, four years ago, and uh, I have a, a, a pretty decent draft of the cicada tree. And I'm thinking, I have absolutely no writing resume, nothing. I mean, when I, when I begin to query an agent, what the heck am I going to say about myself? I have no idea. So it's interesting. I actually took a chapter, the first thing that was ever published, I took a chapter from the cicada tree and tweaked it a bit and made it standalone piece of flash fiction. And that was the first thing that was published. I, I did a look. So I took things that I already worked on and just tweaked them a bit. So by the time that I, I did begin a query, I did have a couple of credits under my belt. Was it all the same chapter that you tweaked that? Yes. 
okay. there was there was a prologue that was in the book that was not used um, in publication. So I, I took the, um, the there was a um, the prologue tweaked it a bit that was published in a publication. There was um, I think the first chapter was um, or at least a scene and it was a piece of flash fiction. And then I did I took a chapter um, about midway in the book uh, that I was able to to make standalone that I had published in another I think the Blue Mountain Review. And then I, I don't know how all this works and I should have clarified at the beginning of this conversation I'm a reader not a writer and so I don't know how all of that works but did you have to take out that what you had already published did you have to remove it from no. the final version no you were able to Mm -hmm. Well, oh, and it's right. interesting because sometimes there's an allure if if an excerpt from your book has been published in in um, in a periodical, uh, you can utilize. And I actually used that in my query that there had been a a chapter that had been revised as a standalone piece of flash fiction that had been published. So sometimes people, um, if I if had a whole if the whole chunk of the book had been published, that would be problematic. But if it's just you know sort of the snippet here or there, I mean with with the flash fiction, I mean, it was just only maybe a thousand words. So we weren't revealing a whole lot about the book. And it had been changed enough where you wouldn't, if you read it, it was enough where it was be standalone, but of course, no, no spoilers, nothing significant revealed with the mm -hmm. plot. And I also read that you won an award for um, best Fla flash fiction. Was that that chapter? Uh, so the very well, so there was an award that I won a hundred years ago with the Atlanta Writers Club for a piece of flash fiction that was not related to to the to that book. Uh, so the cicada tree has won a couple of things, uh, but no, no award for anything that I had written that was um, related to the cicada tree prior to the novel coming out. All right, so now let's talk about the cicada tree. Um, I believe it takes us back down south um so we're, we're not up in atlanta in the northern part of georgia we we go back home ish and so so just tell us about your book and your characters sure so, so elevator pitch which is <laughs> which is something that you know you we all have to learn to do and i think you know condensing a story is one of the most challenging things that i've ever had to do so in essence in the summer of 1956 uh, 11 year old whiskey drinking piano prodigy named Annalise Newell encounters the wealthy Mayfield family, a family that possesses a supernatural beauty that others refer to as that Mayfield shine. It's that initial meeting that stirs obsession within Annalise, taking her down this path of dangerous games and manipulation, all of it culminating into this cataclysmic plague of cicadas. So that's my that's my 50 cent elevator pitch. <laughs> for the cicada tree it, it does take place you know it takes place in a fictitious town i call providence georgia which is not cairo georgia but it's i've cherry picked things so providence is on or around where cairo is geographically so but the, the sense of place that you create is the inspiration from yes. growing up in south yes. georgia Absolutely. I actually laid out the town much like it's laid out in, in Cairo. There's a railroad track that runs right through the middle of Broad Street. So the downtown is very much like Cairo, as I described it in the book, with the exception that we did not have a Woolworth in Cairo. So there is a Woolworth in Providence. Did you have much in Cairo as far as that goes, or did you always have to travel? Uh, as a there were just a few. So growing up, we didn't have a Walmart until high school, until I was in high school. There was a Belk Hudson where a, a lot a small department store where individuals would do quite a bit of shopping. But we spent a lot of time traveling over to Tallahassee to purchase back to school clothes, to go see movies, to go out to eat. Mm -hmm. That was the big city. That was the big city. And <laughs> Thomasville, Georgia, which is um, which is larger than Cairo, which is maybe just 20 minutes away. Can I ask a question? Sure. Absolutely. And this is, you know, a lot of times we try not to be like a book club, but um, 
in in uh, in the book, Annalise lives in a in a kind of a I don't want to call it a shack, but in in a very old kind of wooden home. You know, just really. Where did you get the inspiration for that? Because it's very well described, and you you can really you can really visualize uh, what her life is, what what she's you know because she's barefoot a lot and she's out in the yard. And a couple of key uh, scenes happen in the yard. Um, but did, where did you get the inspiration for that? Did you go and visit some of these older homes, or is it some somewhere you knew? Well, my my mom grew up you know in a circumstance that was not affluent. And she grew up in a sort of, you know, a, sort of a bit of a ramshackle wood frame home. And, um, you know, and in, you know, there are elements, of course, in uh, southwest Georgia where, where, where poverty is quite conspicuous. So, you know, I have, you know, a, a whole swath of friends you know, from varying different backgrounds. You know, I remember um, we had some close family friends who, who lived in, in similar conditions to to Annalise. So I had experienced um, poverty at that level. I did was fortunate not to um, um, live in poverty, but um, certainly lived very close to it. And of course, um, so Annalise is not my mother. I think that if I'm anyone in the book, um, I, I probably more align with Annalise, but I do think of my mom and certain elements of of Annalise and stories that she told me and things that she shared along the way. Yeah, there are parts of the book that are very, very vibrant. Also, you talked about the pickle factory. And I mm -hmm. want to know if your grandparents raised cucumbers, but there's also an element where, you know, the, the father figure, he he works, I forget where he works, but there's also kind of that same element where there is like one mm -hmm. um one business kind of supporting the people of that town. Did you get that idea yeah. from from growing up? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so the wealthy Mayfield family, they own much. They own a local bank. They own um, things throughout the state, but they also own Mayfield Pickle Company. And I sort of stole Mayfield Pickle Company from Cairo, Georgia, and put that in there just sort of as a personal Easter egg. And perhaps anyone who knows the area might would relate to that. So, you know, I did work one summer at the pickle factory when I was 16. I earned enough money to purchase my uh, Granny Gwaltney's old um, Buick LeSabre. <laughs> my father had one. I know it well. <laughs> and, and also, I have to say, a pickle factory is a very cozy job. I like that. Maybe I could throw a pickle factory into one. So of there is, no, I had to tell you that, Liz, there is nothing charming or quaint about working inside a pickle factory. <laughs> there were, it's, there is no, there was no air conditioning. Uh, the smell, uh, you know, of of the pickle brine is oppressive. I just and I just recall the heat, and um, it was one. It's one of those jobs that most parents in Cairo want their children to go do. So, uh, of course, I I always knew that I would go to college. I didn't feel like that I I needed you know them to force my hand. But it was it was a miserable <laughs> it was a miserable summer sure, working at the yeah. pickle factory. I actually drove what they call the pickle train. <laughs> so, when, <laughs> so when they would let they would load up these pallets of pickles that had been packed into boxes, and I would drive it from the uh, packing portion of the plant into the warehouse where things would be loaded onto the um, the, the big eighteen wheeler trucks and carted out of K ride. When okay, these... well, so maybe I'll have a murder happen in the pickle factory. <laughs> you and, could, and the you know, corpse will I... wind up on the pickle train. Oh my! Absolutely, oh my. or 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 maybe a finger in a bottle of in a in a jar of pickles, right? <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Surprise! Okay, so uh, uh, Robert, you just said that um, parents wanted their children to to work in the pickle factory. Was that to get them inspired to yes. try for something more? Absolutely. Um, and I was, again, I grew up extremely sheltered. I was, I went to school with the same group of kids from basically from kindergarten all the way through, you know, being a senior in high school. And um, it was the first time where I had an opportunity to meet other folks that didn't come from families similar to mine. And so I was exposed to various backgrounds and it was just fascinating. I was just in awe of all of these things that I would hear. So I was very quiet and would just sort of listen in on people's conversations. So it's certainly good fodder for writing books. 
for sure, for sure. So, um, so you've told us a little bit about Annalise, but tell us a little bit um, and about you know the circumstances of her growing up. Um, I know that music plays a big role in your story. Can you speak to that for us? So, so in the book, you know, the, the story really is um, about women and really in a way sort of a tribute to some of the Southern women that I have known, all of the women that sort of raised me up. And there, there are these musical things. There's something remarkable about all the women. Annalise is a piano prodigy. And uh, she's her father plays the piano, but he sort of plays a honky tonk piano down on um, down on a honky tonk on the river. By day, it's a bait and tackle, and in the evening, it sort of turns into a jerk joint. So she's always felt like she's known how to play. She can hear something. She can play it. The summer of 1956 is the first time that she hears music, and it, I mean, tastes music, and the first time that she sees music. So something there's this. These, uh, this supernatural thread um, in 1956, this specific summer for her. She has a young friend, a young Black girl. Her name is Etta May. And Etta May uh, is an amazing singer. She, she's a prodigy in her own right. And she has what you would call a, uh, she would be a coloratura soprano. She can, she could hear a language. She could sing in that language. And it's, um, and Annalise suspects that Annalise possesses the ability through her singing to, um, uh, manipulate the emotions of those around her and to perhaps change the natural world around her as well. And her, um, Annalise's mother uh, has the ability to see glimpses of the future in the stitches that she sews. And of course, then you've got the Mayfield family who possess this supernatural beauty that's known as the Mayfield shine. So there's something sort of extraordinary about all of the women, you know, the mm -hmm. protagonists and the, the antagonists and the secondary characters in the book. And um, another reference, like your book has been described as far as the genre goes. Um, it's been identified as Southern fiction. It's been identified as Southern Gothic and the um, component of magical realism, which I think you just touched on. But would you explain to everybody what exactly magical realism is? Um, so for first, you know, I, I think the book does sort of, it crosses genre a bit. And it, it of course, first and foremost, it's Southern. The, um, the Southern Gothic, I, I say it has Southern Gothic tendencies. I don't know that that I fully meet the textbook definition of, of Southern Gothic, but I think it's close. And magical, real, magical realism really is just those elements of the extraordinary that happen within the ordinary world. So I've not... Um, uh, it is within the world that currently exists. So um, it's not fantasy in the realm of I have built a world. I and mean, there is some level of, of world building, but at the end, the story takes place in 1956 in the South in an ordinary town. And you have these extraordinary things that, that, that happen that have elements of magic within the real world. Mm -hmm. But um but like reading, reading the future and the stitching stitches. I mean, that that's kind of uh, the magic of it and to me, to me, that's yes. how I uh, identified that when you, when you referenced um, that. So, um, so music, you made two characters in the book, very musically inclined. And so what is your relationship with music that you felt compelled to bring it into your story? So I, I've always been an admirer of individuals who possess some extraordinary ability. And I'm, you know, greatly moved by music. I'm a fan of music. I, I'm a failed pianist. I took one year and was not very good at it. But I did from the sixth grade through high school, was in the marching band, the concert band. I, I've always been an admirer of music, but I by no way consider myself a great musician. So I think that I was able to incorporate my love of music into these characters, um, sort of being the person I would have liked to have been, I suppose. <laughs> um, so now let's talk about the title, um, because it is unusual. And and so the where does the title come from, and why did you choose cicadas to be so symbolic in this story? So I guess I'll start with the latter. The uh, well, 
so cicadas, I, I recall a summer years ago, I, I was probably, in, well, in Cairo, Georgia, I was maybe around 10, and we were covered up with cicadas. Well, in, in rural South Georgia, we call them locusts, which isn't the correct term. They're cicadas. So for purposes of the book, I thought that I do reference them on occasion as locusts, but I, I call them cicadas because I felt like, you know, across, should anyone outside of the South read this book, they would know what in the heck it was I was talking about. So I do remember the, just the sound of the cicadas that summer. And I remember that their shells after they had molted being everywhere. And since that time, I've never seen or experienced anything like it since that summer. So that, that always uh, weighed in on, on me when I was, uh, I guess it made it, made it such an impression that for some reason I felt compelled to incorporate it into, into the book. But I also created a mythology around the cicadas, the sense that there are these nymphs that are living under the ground and they're listening to everything that's going on above and they're just waiting, you know, until that time till they can sort of claw and make their way out into the world and sing out what they know and tell the truths that they've heard along the way. So it's sort of a Greek chorus in a way, I think, the cicadas. And the title, the title, the, the, there is a reference in the third act in the midst of the cataclysmic uh, plague of cicadas that um, a cicada tree is referenced and it's metaphorical. It's um, Annalise is having a moment with the boy that she has a crush on in the midst of catastrophe. And um, he hugs her and you know she imagines the two of them uh, together uh, rooting down through the center of Providence, uh, sprouting to be this beautiful, gorgeous cicada tree. Um, Liz had referenced um, that uh, the book was had very vibrant scenery and imagery, and that is also something that I was seeing a lot of um, talk about in uh, when I was reading the reviews. And um, that's one thing you're being applauded for is um, bringing, bringing this story to life through the, the feelings and the imagery. And uh, someone even said they can feel the music that you reference as they're reading it or that they could hear the music, like they felt it in, within themselves. So, so going back to you as a writer and um, developing this story, you come across as someone who has written a lot and that this is not a debut novel. And so I'm finding it really fascinating that this is, you know, th these humble beginnings uh, that you shared with us. Um, so I want to just like reference that, that that is really something that's that's coming to be. And, and just out of curiosity, uh, in developing the story, did that come from you and how you wrote it? Or was that encouraged along the way through writing, critiquing, or partnerships with people? So I, I the Cicadetry started off as a different book. I had started to write a book that was going to take place in the 1970s. And the, the protagonist was a little boy 11-year-old boy, and his name was Banks Darlington. And his mother was Annalise Newell Darlington, who is, of course, the protagonist in The Cicada Tree. And she, about partway through, I, Annalise as an adult, as a grown mother, was so fascinating to me. And she was making these really horrible parenting choices. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, what must you have been like as a girl? What made you this way? And so really, that was the jumping off point for me taking her from 1970 to her being a young girl in 1956. And I think I, for many years, I was just working, trying to figure out what my voice would be as a writer. I initially thought that I would be a humorous writer. Well, it turns out I'm not quite so funny on the page. And I love writing in those dark places. So when I was working on that first book that would become the cicada tree, there was a specific scene that I was writing. And, um, and it was in that moment I thought, gosh, so this is who I am and meant to be as a writer. So it, it, it really just in this one moment, you know, came to me, my voice. And, um, and, it, and it happens differently for people, you know, different people. It had taken me a few years to figure out 
what that voice was going to be. And then, of course, from there, I just sort of scrapped all of that. And um, that's how the cicada tree came to be. I think Kathy Can I ask has a question. A question. Oh. Can I ask a question, Dawn? Absolutely. Then Kathy. OK. Um, you, you speak about um, about the women, you know, kind of an homage to the women in your life and Southern women and the relationship between, I guess, Annalise's mother and is it Miss Wessie mm -hmm. is is really beautiful. And it, it's so obvious to me that um, you really like dug down deep. It's almost like if you were a woman, I would say, oh, well, you're bearing your soul. But, you know, maybe you are anyway. But one thing that really struck me was was ha like how close they were and the whole thing you do with uh, Miss Wessie has a wig that she wears and mm -hmm. I thought that was really fascinating because just you were just really getting into like who these people are and and I just thought it was really funny that she named she has a name for the wig the wig is named Lorraine or something no not Lorraine you know what and it, isn't it funny how you spend years of the book and I've just completely gone blank on what in the heck I named that wig. <laughs> Laverne. It's Laverne. No, no, it's, oh my goodness. I hate that I cannot remember um, what she named, but her wig does have, she has named affectionately her her wig. She's given it a name and, and um, she spends quite, quite a lot of time tending it. And how did you find those little, I mean, quirks? Did you get that from just, observing your mother and aunts or grandmother or you know because it's really very tenderly done and and just almost like you know hard to believe that a, it's kind of hard for me a little hard to believe that a man would notice those details of older women you know so but you're just such yes. an observer of you know human well, beings I, I spent I spent a lot of time surrounded by women growing up so we spent a lot of time with my with my granny Louise, my mom's mother, and of course my grandmother Gwaltney as well. I had just a lot of friends that were female when I was growing up. When people talk about the voice and um, and um, having pulled that off being being a man, I always say I think maybe somewhere deep inside I'm an 11 year old girl. I don't know. <laughs> I think um, we all are. <laughs> yes. So I think that that's where that I, I did spend quite you know, and I am um, I love being in the company of women, their conversations are so much more interesting than men's. You know, at home during family gatherings, I would always want to be in the kitchen where the women gather because they were always, um, you know, just uh, had the best stories. You know, the men would be in the living room and they would watch sports and they would grunt. And they wouldn't say much <laughs> of anything. It was very interesting. So I thought, so all, all the good juicy stuff was always going on in the kitchen. I, I actually thought about that. I was like, yeah, the women were in the kitchen probably gossiping. And yep. yeah, that's definitely more interesting than uh, <laughs> look at that pass, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so and look who made a pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Kathy, you're up. I have two questions. And I'm saying that so I don't forget that I have two questions. But the first one, a lot of Southern fiction, and I had some technical um, problems. So if you already answered this, I'm sorry. But the, the town itself, the small town, it seems like a lot of Southern authors with the South and with small towns, they kind of have a love-hate relationship. You know, you, you, you can go home to a small town, but you're not really exactly the same. So did you have, do you have that kind of feeling about the small town South or is it, are you more reconciled with it? So for so long, it seemed to me that growing up in, in Cairo, that it was the center of the universe, you know, as a child might think, you know, it, it's all that there was, I thought. And of course, you know, we're all traumatized during our childhood for various things, right? I mean, we all come through it with, with scars on the other end. But I think that yeah, I don't regret anything about growing up in a small southern town because I don't know that I would be the person that I am today without having had those experiences and I wouldn't have that sensibility or point of view and I probably uh, if things had gone extremely smoothly for me as a as a as a young boy through high school uh, I always sort of felt like I mean it was quite different from the the way that I played my interests were quite different so um 
I sort of was always a little bit on the fringe. So I was an observer. So I think that if I didn't, if I, if I hadn't lived a lot, if I had not had that life in small town, Georgia, who knows if I would even have any interest in, in writing. I, I don't know. But I do feel when I go back home, of course, you know, someone asked me one of the most frightening questions I've ever been asked. I think that it was when I was being interviewed for the Atlanta Journal of Constitution. And they asked me, what was I trying to say about the South? <laughs> mm-hmm. And of course, you know, that's one of those questions you have to be really cautious about. But when it was all said and done, you know, I said, I really didn't set off to tell a story uh, about a, a political story or any story about race. But When you're writing within the realm of the Gothic, you know, you really are exploring some of those elements. So subconsciously, you know, when I was writing that book, I I wasn't so much telling a story about race as I was just um, a story of social class and inequities amongst social class. Because I felt I didn't feel that I was that I had the level of expertise to tell a story about race. And, and it's been done beautifully by so many other Southern writers. And I just just wasn't, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to tell a story about the human condition and about this young girl. And of course, on the tail end of it, I think when it comes to the South, uh, what one has to reconcile is the very harsh realities and truth of the South, you know, socioeconomic and racial disparity and depression with just the very with with the sheer natural beauty of the south and i think that what i love about the south and what i hold on to is family language and uh relationships so for me you know that's when i think of the south i think of i think of those lovely things but of course there's no getting away from the harsh realities that have existed and continue to exist And both of my daughters lived in really large cities for a while. I mean, Atlanta is a good sized city, but you have so many suburbs. It's a little like varying um, atmospheres, but one was in LA and one was in New York. And when they would come home to visit and they both returned to live, they would realize that the, the, the nighttime was noisy with the sounds associated with the cicadas and with the crickets and with the frogs. And, and we don't like live in the country, but you still hear that music at night. And both of them realized that they missed it. Mm-hmm. They, they, it, it startled them how loud the night was. And they, they returned to that with, uh, I think, a kind of joy. And I feel like you've got that in your book. It's like, of course, there's lots of problems. There are problems everywhere. Uh, you can't write about the South without there being a racial component uh, because it it's part of Fair. part of who we are, and I think you do a, a beautiful job of that without turning it into the centerpiece for the novel. But my other question, you got me all excited. I don't know if you're working on another book or not, but when you mm-hmm. mentioned Annalise as an adult, I wondered, do you feel differently? about the character that you were working on, the adult Annalise, now that you know her as a child? And do you feel like you're going to pursue her? I, I thought about, I do think there are, could potentially be more stories to tell. I mean, I love, love Annalise, and I think I regard her more highly than I did originally when I was exploring her as, as an adult. I haven't, um, I've started another story that's that doesn't it's a that doesn't incorporate these characters um but maybe you know one day I'll, I'll go back I'll go back to them and I love I love your names what was Banks is the one you've got if you ever go back to that character I think it's so much fun picking out names for yes I, I so use, important they are I mean names what we call things and what we call others I think is so important I you know that's why I stole the the name mistletoe from because I had a family connection to a farm that was folded into that place that that truly exists I did use um so Annalise's father's name is Claxton I had a great grandfather whose name was Claxton who was a who was the town drunk (laughs) because I had my mother's permission to use his name she was fine with that um 
so I did I did play around with some of those things. And did, there's not a Banks in this specific book, but Banks is an is a last is a family name. It's a, mm-hmm. a last name of um on my mother's side. So I do like to sort of incorporate some of those Easter eggs into into my writing. Thank you. Um, do you um how what has the reception been locally in Cairo to this to this book? <laughs> One of the first events that I had was in my hometown in Cairo at the Roddenberry Memorial Library, the library that I went to when I was a boy. And on that particular day, it was a Saturday, there, there's this huge event that occurs over in Wiggum, Georgia, and it's called the Rattlesnake Roundup. <laughs> so I was competing with the Rattlesnake Roundup and still had a really <laughs> good turnout. But we had about, you know, 80 some odd folks. And it was it was one of the most emotional of uh, experiences going back there uh, i had high school teachers that showed up individuals that i had not seen since the 1980s when i graduated high school so it i think that what people and people were were very loving uh, i wasn't quite sure how i would be received or the book would be received one of the there was a, a young librarian there who interviewed me and she ticked off she said Pickle Factory, Miss Joanne Woodward, and I use the name Miss Wessie, and Miss Wessie was the um, librarian for many years at the Roddenberry Memorial Library, and I loved her, and so I used her name for a character in the cicada tree, and so she listed through all these things, and she says, so what people want to know <laughs> is Providence Cairo, <laughs> Right, because uh, you know they were sort of wanting to see themselves in the town mm-hmm. in the book, and of course I explained that Providence is fictitious, but I did cherry pick a few things, but it's completely a work of fiction. Yeah, and and I'm sure that's also part of the 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 questioning is like, is he writing about me? Like, yeah, right? You know, well, like- my mom and dad. I, well, my mom, I think, was she not? She didn't know what I was working on, but she knew that I was writing. But I think she was very suspicious about it all, <laughs> and I think that she was really nervous, you know, that I might have um, written something that would get her kicked out of Eastside Baptist Church. <laughs> oh, um, but when it was all said and done, she loved the book. My brothers have all read it, which is astonishing to me, and. Um, you would have thought on that day in Cairo, Georgia, that my mom and dad had written the book. So they were they were they were very proud about it all. Well, I I love hearing that. It's obviously been a very positive experience for you all around. And I, you know, you can go home again, right? They say you, you can, can, but it sounds like you can. And with bells and whistles and in competition with the rattlesnake roundup. That's amazing. Yeah. It is astonishing. <laughs> yeah. I want to share um your your friend Daryl has some funny things uh, to say, and so I'm just <laughs> going to share some of his comments. He said, um, "Murder on the pickle train." Uh, he yep. threw that out there as a possible title, and then he also threw out "Murder at the Rattlesnake Roundup." So he's go. he's inspiring over here. He's getting our juices flowing. Um, he also said, "You get all poetic and beautiful sounding just talking about cicadas." I think that is a really and I agree. I agree with him. Um, I think that's very, uh, a very loving uh, thing. Um, so uh, we're we're getting close to our time. It always goes by so fast. It does go by quick. <laughs> and I always have so many things I want to I want to chat about more. But let's go ahead and and round it up so everybody can get started on this beautiful Saturday morning. And um, Robert, if you would share with us something a book that you recommend that we all you know get off the shelf and get in our hands and read. So every year, so I always make a point of reading what wins the Pulitzer. So I've started reading Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. And the voice is just <laughs> amazing. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the beginning of that. So I, I would set, definitely say check that one out. I do have on my t- to-be-read list, uh, Salvage the World by um, Michael Ferris Smith. And it's sort of a um, takes place in Florida. Uh, there's a faint, it has a bit of an apocalyptic nature to it. Um, global warming has caused the waters to rise in Florida. So you have this family that's just trying to survive this, that circumstance. 
And then I did read a lovely young adult novel that has elements of magical realism in it by T.J. Klune. And I love this title, The House on the Cerulean Sea. I like that too. Very poetic. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a delight. Um, I had told you that I ordered your book. It hasn't come in yet. I or I did the right thing and I ordered from I an see. independent bookseller. Um, and it's just taken a little bit longer uh, than than I would like. But I honestly can't wait to get my hands on it. I'm Thank really you. looking forward to it. And um, even more so after chatting with you, you have been a delightful uh, interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So Lance, you want to close us out? Okay. Thank you, Robert, for a fascinating hour. And uh, uh, I'm enjoying your book as well. And we have been uh, listening to uh, an interview between Don Gepfer and Robert Gwaltney, the author of The Cicada Tree on Off the Shelf. Now, coming up in the next couple of weeks, we have on the first Saturday of June, it's June already, um, <laughs> Reader Rendezvous, where you can come and talk about what you're reading and why you like it. And writers are invited as well, but you have to come as a reader. Then on the second Saturday of June, which is June 10th, we are not going to have a chapter meeting per se. We're going to have lunch, and that's going to be at six feet under the location on Memorial across from Oakland Cemetery. And weather permitting, after lunch, we will take a stroll uh, through the cemetery and see if we can find some buried authors there. So remember, it's not going to be available on Zoom. It's an in-person lunch at six feet under. And if you um, will be putting out an email for that, and we will need responses in advance of that uh, in order to arrange seating. So. Thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, welcome uh, Daryl and any other visitors. We're glad you're here. And Robert, good luck with your next book. Yeah. Okay, so that's it from Sisters in Crime Atlanta chapter. Have a good long weekend, everybody.